morning, church. It's a great day to be in church, isn't it? Oh, it's, I'm so excited to be here. If you want to turn with me to Mark chapter 10, if you brought your Bible with you, if not, that's fine. We're going to show you the verses on the screen. But let me ask you a question. Has anyone here ever heard of the Darwin Awards? All right, so the Darwin Awards are, they're awards given out each year to those with an incredible amount of overconfidence who do incredibly stupid or even impossible things and they all die. Um, that's why it's called the Darwin Awards. They're basically weeding themselves out of the gene pool. So, for instance, somebody tried to launch a jet ski over the Niagara Falls. Um, another two guys um, tried to jump a drawbridge that was open with their car and failed. Uh, as you've guessed, almost all these awards go to men. Um, it's probably no surprise. One of the 2020 awards went to a guy named Michael Sexton. And his story is uh, sad but true. He says this. Well, let me read this story to you. Um, he was hunting for treasure, which was hidden by the very eccentric and controversial man named Forrest Fenn. This man, Forrest Fenn, claimed to have buried $2 million worth of gold coins and artifacts somewhere out in the Rocky Mountains. Uh, he wrote a poem giving clues where it could be found. I actually know someone from Montana that was searching for this treasure and was convinced it was in Yellowstone National Park. Over 350,000 people have gone looking for the treasure. Five people have died trying to find it. Now, unlike the rest of them, Michael knew where the treasure was buried. So he talked a 65-year-old friend into joining him on this treasure hunt. So in February of 2020, they headed to Dinosaur National Monument on the Colorado-Utah border. Michael was so certain that he knew where the treasure was that neither he nor his colleague prepared for an overnight stay in the mountains no doubt assuming that if they started early enough, they'd be home by dinner, $2 million richer. Well, Michael was wrong. They found no treasure. They lost their bearings. They were extremely cold and hungry and disoriented, and they were very close to death when they were miraculously found by a search and rescue team who brought them down the mountain. One month later, having sufficiently recovered, Michael and his friend set out for a second try. This time, they had, I'm not lying about this, a few candy bars and two bottles of water. <laughs> good, good job. They, they, they also rented two snowmobiles and headed back into the park. Two days later, rescuers found the abandoned snowmobiles, and found the two men about a mile away at the exact spot, almost at the exact spot, where the previous rescue a month earlier had occurred. Michael was dead, and his friend barely survived. In Mark chapter 10, we encounter another overconfident man who has overestimated his goodness, and he's also trying to do something that is impossible. He's trying to be good enough to get to heaven. Mark chapter 10, verse 17, it says, as he, as Jesus, was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he, the young man, said to him, teacher, all these I've kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him. And said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now, 
this is a really interesting story. So you got this rich young guy. He runs up to Jesus. He falls on his knees. And then he asks the most important question that has ever been asked. This is the most important question in the world. It is the most important question that you will ever ask. No other question even comes close to the importance of of this one. If you have the right answer to this question, it can give you everlasting joy and eternal life in heaven. If you have the wrong answer to this question, the result is everlasting punishment. Now, fortunately, this rich young ruler is asking this monumental question to the right person. He's asking Jesus. And if anyone knows the right answer, it's the Son of God. So let's, let's see what he says. The question is this, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And I have four things. So number one, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Number one, Make sure that your definition of good is good. Did you notice how the rich young man addressed Jesus? He called him good teacher, which was not a typical way to address a rabbi. The word good was normally reserved for God alone. The rich young ruler is not thinking that Jesus is God. He's thinking that Jesus is is a good teacher, and he's probably good enough to get to heaven, and I want to make sure that I'm good enough to get to heaven. When Jesus says, why do you call me good, he's trying to get at the guy's definition of good. What's his standard? Does he think he's good? Well, apparently he does, because he claims to have kept all the commandments. He's giving himself really high marks. That's because he has a bad definition of good. His definition of good was bad. So Jesus helps him straighten this out before answering his question. He says, no one is good except God alone. God alone is good. God alone is perfectly pure. He is perfectly righteous. All that he does is good and right. God is the one that defines what goodness is, and that means that we don't. It also means that our goodness is not as good as we usually think. Romans 3.10 absolutely detonates our perception of our own goodness. It says this, there is no one righteous. How about one? Not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now, like most of us, the rich young ruler softened the definition of good. He, he weakened it. He, he made it more achievable. He lowered the standard. And we can do the same thing. It, it's so easy for us to make excuses for what we do, to, to give ourselves a pass. I can gossip and slander someone and justify it because as a pastor I'm charged with caring for their soul. We have an incredible ability to assume that we're good no matter what we're doing. Like convincing ourselves that it's okay to yell at our kids or to judge someone or to exaggerate, which is really lying, or to look at some pornography. But we're still okay. We're, we're still good. It seems like no matter what we do, we think we'll be fine. But what if we're overconfident? What if we're just lying to ourselves? 
it's easy to, to lower the standard. And another popular strategy is to actually eliminate the standard. One way to feel better about your chances is to actually get rid of the standard. If there's no standard, then we can all get in. And bonus, we can get rid of that guilty feeling that we walk around with. But Jesus stands in the way of this. He, he stands over this rich young ruler and he throws a glass of cold water in his face. He's, he's trying to wake him up. Now when this guy asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus didn't say, okay, listen, come here, here's what you have to do. You need to feed the homeless, you need to volunteer at a special needs camp, and you need to call your mother once a week. Which you should do that. He said, do you think you're good? Do you think your good deeds are the way to get to heaven? Do you think that most people are good? There is only one who is good. And the rest are bad. And he proves that by pointing this young man to the Ten Commandments. And that's the second point. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Number two, don't compare yourself to others. Jesus took him to the law. He said, you know the commandments. Don't murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, and honor your father and your mother. So now Jesus gets to the guy's questions. How do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus is basically saying, okay, you want to go the good deed route? Let's look at the commandments. In the book of Deuteronomy and Ezekiel, it says that those who keep the law will live. In other words, in order to have eternal life, you have to keep the law. You have to be perfect. Not because God is a perfectionist or he's just a stickler who wants to make it hard on us. No, because he is holy. That means he's set apart. He's, he's transcendent, which means he is high above us. He is perfectly pure. He is perfectly righteous. That means that he can't have sin and rebellion in his presence. Sinfulness and disobedience to any degree do not mix well with God. He's too pure and too holy. And when we realize this, we start to doubt our own goodness. We don't want to compare ourselves to God and to his perfection. It's, it's much easier to just compare ourselves to one another. And I'm very familiar with this. I am an identical twin. And so my brother and I, we were constantly comparing ourselves to one another. Everything was a competition and a comparison. And the problem with this is you could never kind of set yourself apart. The competition was too steep. We were always very equally matched in everything. So you could never really get that far ahead. So we realized this, and later on we just formed a unit, a team, and then we began to compare ourselves to others and judge them and look down on others. And that's when we became best friends. <laughs> it was kind of us against everyone else. This is what the rich young ruler was doing. He's just comparing himself to others, to his siblings maybe, his friends, his neighbors, and he's always coming out on top. So Jesus takes him to the commandments so that he can compare himself to God. Jesus knows that the law can't get us to heaven. We're too corrupted by sin. People who think they're good enough to get to God don't realize how sinful we are. And that's where the commandments can really help us. I've asked hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, the question, on a scale of one to 10, how good do you think you are? And most people give themselves high marks. When I first started to do this around 20 plus years ago, people would give themselves usually a six or seven, and it's, it's gone up from there. Now it's more like seven or eight. I have many people that would give themselves a 9 or a 10. I had one person that actually gave themselves an 11. <laughs> These go up to 11, so she's at 11. I mean, she's beyond perfect. One of the purposes of the law is to give us knowledge of our sin, to show us that we, we don't measure up well with God. So... 
Let's see how we do. Jesus starts with the sixth commandment, which says, you shall not murder. Now, you might think, great. I'm doing pretty well in this category. Maybe this isn't going to be so hard. Well, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that if we hate someone, we've murdered them in our hearts. Have you ever hated someone? I have. Growing up, there were three kids that I absolutely hated. And as I was preparing this message, I only had two of them in my mind, and I, I remembered a third. One of them stole a mini bike from us. The other two were, like me, extremely arrogant and obnoxious. And I know their names because I hated them for a long time. I murdered them again and again and again in my heart. 1 John 3, 5 says, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. Have you ever hated anyone? If so, you've murdered them in your heart. The seventh commandment says, you shall not commit adultery. Jesus said, if you look at another woman lustfully, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Jesus is saying that sin isn't just what we do outwardly. It's not just outward actions. It's, it what's, it's what's happening in our hearts. Have you ever lusted after someone? Commandment number eight, you shall not steal. Now, maybe you'll say, well, I never stole anything. Uh, have you ever plagiarized? Have you ever cheated on your taxes? Have you ever taken something that doesn't belong to you? Does it have to be something big to make you a thief? 1 Corinthians 6 says that those who've stolen will not enter the kingdom of God. Number nine, you shall not lie. Have you ever lied? Listen, it is so easy for us to lie, for lies to come off of our lips. And if you tell me you've never lied, you've just proven that you're a liar. (laughs) And keep in mind, listen, the commandments are not general suggestions. They are a standard of perfection. They are a law. So you don't pass if you generally don't lie. You have to never lie. So imagine hypothetically if you and your twin brother were torturing your younger brother, who happens to be named Mikey, and you were hanging him over a balcony in a sleeping bag when your mother comes racing up the steps, screaming at you to stop. You wouldn't say, okay, well, Mom, calm down. We don't generally suspend Mikey over 10-foot drops. She doesn't care about what we generally do. She cares about what we're doing right now. We violated one of her main laws, which is don't kill your younger brother. (laughs) Which also happens to be the first commandment that we looked at, do not murder. Then Jesus does something interesting. He adds a commandment. He says, do not defraud. Now, this isn't one of the Ten Commandments, but Jesus seems to combine number eight, which is stealing, and number nine, which is lying. Why is he doing this? Well, I think it's because the rich young ruler needs it to be spelled out for him. Jesus is trying to cut through his overconfidence by specifically mentioning the word defraud. Maybe that's how this guy got rich. And so Jesus is spelling it out for him. And then Jesus goes back up to number five, which is honor your father and mother. Have you perfectly honored and obeyed your father and your mother? Again, it's not have you generally obeyed your parents. Have you perfectly honored and obeyed them? I haven't. Remember the story about hanging my brother over the thing. I I mean, that's only one example. Now, the other Ten Commandments, we're not going to talk about them, but they, they focus more on how we relate to God, like, like not taking the Lord's name in vain. 
like saying the word, oh my God, which the Bible calls blasphemy, or not putting things above God, or loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Now, even if you think you've kept most of these commandments, James 2.10 says, for whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. You don't have to break every link to break a chain. You just have to break one link and the chain is broken. You just have to break one command and you are a lawbreaker. See, the Ten Commandments were never meant to clean us up and make us worthy of heaven. No, they were meant to show us how dirty and sinful we are. Imagine if you were outside working all day, you were full of dirt and mud, and you came into the bathroom, you looked in the mirror, saw how hard you were, took the mirror off the wall, and started to try to scrub yourself with the mirror. Okay, that's that's not a good idea, and it's, it's not possibly going to work. Trying to be good enough to get to God is doing just that. A mirror is meant to show you the dirt so that you get in the shower. Romans chapter 3 tells us that the law stops us from justifying ourselves and holds us accountable to God. It helps us to see our sin. So this was a great move by Jesus to take this young ruler to the law. Now, I don't know about you, but going through the Ten Commandments like we just did is is very convicting. And I'm guessing that this young ruler was convicted as well. Let's, Let's see how he responds. Verse 20, he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. What? He never took anything that wasn't his. He never lied. He never defrauded anyone. He never disobeyed his parents. I mean, this has got to be one of the proudest statements in the Bible. He's talking to the only person on earth who has kept all the commandments, the only person who is perfectly righteous. He said, oh, yeah, I've kept all those. Got that check. Anything else? Is there something else I should do? This rich young ruler is asserting his righteousness in front of Jesus. Now, he might not think he's perfect, but he thinks that his good works are good enough. This is, this is not only arrogant, it's incredibly ignorant. He is unaware of how far he is from God. And I think we can be too. One of the things I stink at, and I think that Americans in general stink at this, is self-awareness and self-assessment. You know, we tend to be wildly inaccurate when it comes to our own goodness. My one grandfather, who was terribly arrogant, he was argumentative and selfish, he was chauvinistic, he was racist, he once told me that he had never sinned. Now, that's an extreme example, but, but this is a problem we all have. We don't accurately understand how sinful we are. The irony is that the people around us know how sinful we are. And you could find out how sinful you are by asking them, but they probably wouldn't tell you because you're too proud to hear it. See, we we tend to be blinded to our sin. So what does Jesus do with such pride and arrogance, such overconfidence? Well, verse 21 tells us, it says, and Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Jesus loved him. Jesus still loved him loved him. I find this incredible. We have trouble loving people who are proud and arrogant. We have trouble with people who are overconfident and self-righteous. That's why I hated those kids in school, and that's why people hated me. We can't take people who think that they're better than others. Everything in us wants to oppose and reject and tear them down, but not Jesus. 
not Jesus. He loves the proud and the self-sufficient and the unrighteous. Why? Why does Jesus love sinners like this? Because he's so overflowing with love that he can power through our sin. He wants us to know his love and joy. He wants us to know eternal happiness and peace. He doesn't want to keep it all to himself. He wants to share it with us. And so he powers through our sin. We can't power through sin like that. But thank God that he can. Listen, if Jesus can't love sinners, if he can't love the proud, then there is no hope for us. Jesus loved this young man. And in love, he sent a short-range ballistic missile straight into his self-righteousness. Jesus takes it to DEFCON 1 and just blows up his goodness. Look at what it says in verse 21. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now, when Jesus says this, he's speaking tongue in cheek. He's not saying, okay, well, you're close to perfection. You're almost there, buddy. Just one more thing. Give all your money to the poor. No, Jesus is exposing his idol and showing him his love for money. He was showing him how far short he falls of God's perfection. And that brings us to the third point. The second was don't compare yourselves to others. The third is give up on yourself. Give up on yourself. Let's look at verse 22 through 27. It says, disheartened by this saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. And Jesus, looking around, And said to his disciples, he looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. So this young man, he was disheartened. He lost heart. He was was sad. Why? Well, he was willing to make some sacrifices. He was willing to give up some things, but this was too much Amy Carmichael, who was a missionary in India in the early 1900s, she was at one time sitting with a Hindu queen. And Amy Carmichael was reading to her verse by verse from the Bible. And as she read, the queen's face became very sorrowful. And the queen said, so far must I follow? So far? I cannot follow so far. It was too far for this queen. It it was too far for this rich young ruler. And so he's walking away with his head down. And Jesus looks up and he declares how difficult it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now this makes sense to us, right? I mean, when you have a lot of stuff, it's harder to give it up. You have a lot to lose. And there's a temptation to put your trust in finances, to to find security in a full bank account, which makes it harder to trust God and find security in him. And I feel bad for these rich people. Jesus is saying, hey, it's going to be tough for them to get in. But why do we always fall below the imaginary riches danger line? You know, this doesn't really apply to us because we're not rich. I read some recent statistics. One said on a global scale or compared to the world, the vast majority of Americans are either upper middle income or high income. Another one said the poorest 20% of Americans are richer on average than most nations of Europe. The average American home, this one stunned me, has 300,000 items. 
in the average American home. And on average, every American throws away over 68 pounds of clothing per year. I think it would be accurate to say that most of us are above the riches danger line. And that the warnings in this passage apply to us. So why were the disciples so amazed when Jesus said it would be difficult for a rich man to make it to heaven? Well, because riches to a Jewish person was an indication of blessing. It meant that you had favor from God, like many of the patriarchs and others in the Old Testament. The rich were powerful and influential, and so the disciples thought it would be easy for them, but Jesus is saying, no, it's going to be difficult for them. And then he says that not only is it going to be difficult for them, it's going to be difficult for anyone to enter the kingdom of God. And then he says, not only is it going to be difficult for anyone, it's going to be impossible. Verse 25 says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's not only going to be hard to get into the kingdom of God, it's impossible. It's like trying to get a camel, which is the largest animal in Palestine, through the eye of a needle. It can't happen. Now the disciples are exceedingly astonished. If the rich who are blessed and powerful, if they can't make it, who can? Jesus declares, no one can. Not by our own works. We are permanently stained and polluted by sin. God has to do it. The disciples then bring us back to the original question. They say, who then can be saved? If it's impossible with man, how can we get to heaven? Well, Jesus tells us with God all things are possible. Okay, so how is it possible for God to save us? How can he clean us up and make us worthy? Well, it would take an extraordinary act of love and sacrifice. Jesus knows what it would take. The rich young man thought the cost to follow Jesus was too high, but the cost to save us was much higher for Jesus. To save us, it cost Jesus his relationship with the Father. It cost Jesus his life. He died a brutal and horrific death on the cross to make a way for us, to make the only way for us. He died to pay for our sins. He took our place. He received our wrath, all so that we could inherit eternal life. If you want to inherit eternal life, you have to give up on the idea that you can earn your way to heaven. You have to realize that it's impossible to be good enough to get to heaven. That's why Jesus came and died in our place. If we're good enough, then we don't need Jesus' death on the cross. We can get there on our own. And that leads me to the final point. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Number four, follow Jesus. Follow Jesus, verse 28. Peter began to say to him, see, we've left everything and followed you. Remember, the the young man did not follow Jesus. So here's the contrast. Peter's like, we're following you. We followed you. Jesus said, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. So he's talking about the blessings in this life. Houses and brothers and children and sisters and mothers and lands with persecution, it's not all going to be a bed of roses, there's going to be trials, with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Now, one of the things I find interesting is the fact that this rich young ruler kneels before Jesus. Remember that? He runs up and he kneels down before Jesus. This whole conversation is taking place with the guy on his knees. He's humbling himself. And yet he's full of pride. He's full of self-confidence. And I think the same can be true of us. We can do things that are outwardly humble and good, but inside 
we can be full of pride, like, like going to church and judging the people who aren't there or saying grace before you eat and then complaining about what you're having. You know, we can bow down to Jesus as long he does, as he doesn't ask for too much. As long as he doesn't ask for too much. We, we can show reverence to him. But that's not enough. We can have deep respect for Jesus. But that's not enough. Growing up, I was in church every Sunday. I, I knelt down in a pew many times during the service. But I was not a follower of Jesus. I was following what the world had to offer me. To have eternal life, you must follow Jesus. It doesn't mean that you have to sell everything, but you do have to give your heart to Jesus. You have to leave the other gods and idols behind and follow Jesus. I think that this rich young ruler is a lot like us. We aren't afraid to show reverence and respect to Jesus. But when he asks us to give him our hearts and follow him, we hesitate and even walk away. What is Jesus asking you to leave behind? What is it that you are following? Jesus is loving us by pointing out our sin. Will you follow him or will you walk away sad?